he's not made out of any type of material, material stuff. It's not made of parts and he's not made of properties that we would see in creation. And he's, of course, he's not subject to time or space. He's timeless and spaceless. Hey friends, and welcome back to another episode of Called and Unqualified, a Create Worship Inspire video series. My name is Brenna, and if you don't know me already, I'm unqualified to be a spiritual or philosophical expert of any kind, and today we have a very special guest joining us again today. We have Nick Brewer. Nick, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. So Nick, when you and I became friends, we started talking about philosophy because this is definitely an area where I want to improve. So how did you get interested in philosophy? Yeah, so I think... um... Originally, I started reading history, just American history and world history, that got me into or like the political side of things and politics, which led into more uh, political philosophy and then um, into uh, theology, philosophy and that range. So I started reading a philosopher, a theologian named Aquinas, who was a Catholic, and Aristotle. And uh, that kind of brought me into getting into arguments for God's existence and then in turn getting into uh, philosophy in general. So it sounds like the philosophy has been really intertwined with some of your faith. So how would you say like your deeper interest in philosophy has impacted your faith? Yeah, I think um, it's definitely opened my mind to other views and it's helped me get into how should we think of uh, god for example and then from scripture we can uh use philosophy to help us understand god and um it certainly helped me uh communicate as well in terms of reasoning uh thinking about things logically etc and uh, just expand my mind really so yeah absolutely and i feel like that's one of the reasons why i really wanted to ask you to be a guest on this episode because I feel like you have not only a better handle on it, but just you're so familiar that you're able to communicate it a lot easier than a lot of other people would. So I know, <laughs> I know you and I have talked about it before. Um, what would be some of your arguments for the existence of God? Yeah, so I think um, a lot, there's two arguments that I, ex- I like uh, reading about and exploring. Uh, the first argument is... Um, the Leibnizian cosmolo- or cosmological argument, which is uh, from a philosopher named Gottfried Leibniz. And the premises go something like this. So premise one, every contingent fact has an explanation. Premise two, there is a contingent fact that includes all other contingent facts. Premise three, therefore, or there is an explanation of this fact. Premise, uh, premise three, that was premise three, sorry. Premise four would be this explanation must involve a necessary object. And then this uh, necessary object is God. So. Uh, for premise one, uh, contingent fact is usually facts in philosophy. There's different definition, but the use, the way it's used here is states of affair. So um, I'm wearing sweats and an olive covered shirt. There's a state of affairs uh, possibility that there's another world, for example. When we say world, um, we're usually just meaning um, just an imaginary uh, way of thinking about things that are different, that are contra possible per se or counterfactual. As we said, there's just a different state of affairs where I could be not wearing these color clothes or we could not be having this conversation. But in any case, uh, yeah, so contingent facts of state of affairs, they could be otherwise or just not happen at all. Every state's affair needs an explanation. And then um, there's presumably we could have an infinite amount of states of affairs and um, that would include all these contingent facts. So therefore there's a collection of uh, these facts and there's a principle called the PSR or principle of sufficient reason. It was just to, it was just to state that every fact must have an explanation for why something is the case. So there's a reason why I'm doing this podcast. There's a reason why the mood is in the sky. There's a reason why the sun sets the way it does. All these, all these facts that have an explanation. And it seems like we kind of do this in science. Like we're always, we always kind of presuppose there's some kind, of, kind of explanation in science that we're looking for, whether or not we find the answer or not. There's still, we're still looking, there's a possibility of an answer that we're looking for. And so, uh, Basically, there's a necessary uh, fact about this, and uh, that would be that would the deduction or whatever the deduction would be, God at the end of the day that would explain all these contingent facts, and He's a necessary being, which means um, He couldn't be otherwise. 
eternal and all the other attributes that we're talking about. And so that's basically, in short, the argument uh, there in very simple fashion. The other argument is an argument from knowledge, which is comes from a philosopher named uh, James Anderson. And um, the argument goes something like this. It's called the unity argument for God. And um, it's kind of a short argument, but it basically goes like this. Premise one, if no one has comprehensive knowledge of the universe, uh, then no one can have knowledge of the universe. Only God can have comprehensive knowledge of the universe. Premise three, we have some knowledge of the universe, therefore God exists. Um, so the basic idea is that God knows all states of affairs. He knows he's omniscient. He has knowledge of all things. And so in order for us to know anything, we must have uh, we must, human knowledge must be possible in some way. So it is, <laughs> so in that case, um, we suppose that we have some sense of justification for our beliefs. And um, we have to rule out the idea of skeptical scenarios that undermine our, uh, our knowledge claims. So we could think of um, that if you know anything about Descartes, he raised a skeptical scenario of a Cartesian demon which is a deceiver basically that undermines, he's giving us delusions and giving us uh, false beliefs about the world, which would make knowledge impossible. But in this case, God would uh, create our faculties to be approximate in this world so we can have some sense of knowledge. And although we are fallible, meaning we can be mistaken, uh, we have some access to knowledge and we have, uh, we're made in God's image so we can reason about the world, we can be rational about the world. And um, since we have knowledge, God would, uh, God's use from that, so. So, yeah, I feel like the way that you were saying that was such a straightforward explanation for how we can tell that there is an existence of God. But how would you describe, like, who God is, and, like, God's character? Um, I think the, there's obviously a lot of philosophers over the centuries and millennia who have come to conclusions of how, who God is or what God is. There's different conceptions of different religions and theists who have different conceptions without non-religious theists for that matter. But I think uh, from, a, from a Christian point of view, although there's a lot of philosophers who make deductions about or inductions about um, who God is outside of scripture, I think the, the, from my point of view, the only way we can know who God is is what he's revealed to us. Meaning we look at the scripture and he's told us who he is. He's told us that he's all-knowing. Um, he's told us that he's good. He's loving. He's just merciful. All these, uh, all these things in scripture. And I think from our point of view, since he's revealed that infallible and the Bible's infallible, uh, we know who God is because he's told us. It's, you know, we're basically reading a Bible in, in a sense. It's basically like God's speech in a way that he's speaking to us and who God is. He's revealed to us who he is. And so we get a taste of basically what God is in terms of his attributes. And I think that for me, that's, that's sufficient to know who God is at the end of the day. Um, although we can reason about why God is this way. <clears throat> for example, if you have a creator of the universe, presumably you want him to be immaterial, for example. Because otherwise he would just be another member of the set of all uh, material things, for example. So he couldn't be material in terms of a creator. Otherwise he wouldn't be ultimate in terms of what we think of uh, how God is in terms of the creator of everything. So that's just an example of how philosophers, a simple example of how philosophers I've thought of it but in the, the day for like I said for me it's it comes down to what scripture has told us and, um what he's revealed so deducting the fact that God is he, who he says he is and his like revealed truth that he gave to us through the bible like how would you well, what would be some of those attributes of God yeah so I think there's a number of attributes the omnis so all, all good uh, God is uh, all-knowing all-powerful all present, all knowing. One thing I'm missing on, um, uh, benevolent, loving. I would say those are some of the main attributes that we can point to. And then obviously he has other attributes like he's immaterial, um, uh, timeless, spaceless, etc. Do you kind of want to, for those that are unfamiliar with what the omnis are, do you want to kind of expand on what those are just a little bit? Yeah, sure. If we want to start with like being um, all knowing, God has complete knowledge of all facts about who we are all facts about his creation in its entirety. Being all powerful, he basically can create everything from nothing in a sense. We have this idea of ex nihilo, which means uh, God doesn't use anything outside of himself to create. He doesn't call upon anything. There's no instruments that he calls upon to create. Um, all present meaning he's 
um, present in all times in terms of uh, in terms of creation, not in the sense that he's in creation in all times, but he is sustaining the world at all times, and he uh, set the world in motion at all times. Um, God is all loving, so he, yeah, he. You know, in terms of loving, we talk about you know biblical type of love, putting you know coming into the world, dying on the cross, putting himself, putting uh, us above himself to uh, save us, basically. And uh, in material meaning, he uh, is not made out of any type of material stuff. It's not made of parts. Um, and he's not made of properties that we would see in creation. And he's, of course, he's not subject to time or space. He's timeless and spaceless. Yeah. And so you touched on this a little bit. It was kind of like God's loving nature. And I feel like one of the things for me that was for the longest time really difficult for me to wrap my mind around was mm-hmm. the fact that God is a God of justice, but he's also a God of love. So yeah. if you were going to describe that attribute of God and that balance, how would you put that? Yeah, so I think, um, I think a lot of people, not just you and even me, I contend with how God is just and loving. I, I would say that, um, I would say God's just is, in, is an expression of his love. And I think this is the case in three ways. So first, uh, because sin is against God, it's an, and basically sin is an insult to God's holiness. And so it's right for God to seek rep, uh, recompense for that insult. And then furthermore, uh, God is trying so here for him to not seek justice is to not seek self-worth, but more uh, especially in a Trinitarian way, uh, for the Father to not um, command justice made against those who have sinned against his son is for him to be minimally in, indifferent to his son. And it's to say that um, I don't care that you've defaced the glory of the word of my son because I don't care about him. So you can get, you can just basically get away with all you want. You can just spit in his face, uh, call all types of things to him and nothing will happen. But we know love demands, uh, demands that we stand up for those who we love. We, you know, that's what we do all the time in this world, for example. That's how we show love. So it makes sense for God to seek recompense and then uh, judge the um, judge those who spit who basically spit in the face of the Father, and for the Father to condemn those who have blasphemed the Holy Spirit and etc. Um, second, I would say that justice is part of human extension. So uh, justice benefits who uh, those who are victims of sin, and when a person is punished by God by murdering someone else, God is vindicating his victims. You can think of like rape victims, for example, who are uh, scarred by the sins of someone someone else and there is a good and right acceptable sense of peace that comes with a person who knows that their enemy has been destroyed and i think we all kind of get that sense in a certain way when people have done bad against us and we see them get uh what they deserve basically and for those you know and then for those who god is saving basically because we we want to be um want to be fair in this world but and he's vindicating his people not only protecting them but uh from further harm but he's also destroying the wicked. And so he is showing his glory by benefiting those human beings. And that shows his closer intimacy by destroying the wicked. And I think um, in the West, we kind of have a kind of a hard, it's a hard way to think about this because in the West, I think we prefer to show grace and there's nothing wrong with showing grace uh, because we want mercy to be shown. However, um, there is a good and right, uh, there's a kind of a good and right peace that we see with God. And we kind of get when God shows his justice and um, we kind of worship in a sense that part of God where in terms of he's getting rid of the pain that we're something. So there's something good about that. And I think uh, this is kind of shown it with Paul and one of his Deathlonian letters that he actually encouraged the, um, the people who are suffering at the time uh, to feel at peace that they know that those who per- persecuted him, they did all kinds of terrible things or subject to all types of uh, terrible things. And those bad guys, you know, if they are not saved to be comforted that God will repay uh, for what they did to them. basically. And I think a lot of people, like I said, I think I do struggle with that in terms of how God uh, portrays his justice at times, but it does give me peace at the end of the day that the people who are very evil in this world will get what they deserve in terms of their sin. And then the last one, which I think is a little less important than the last two, but it's so important. Um, there's a kind of cosmic outworking of justice where 
when human beings um, have been subjected to, you know, we've been subjected to the universe's, uh, universe's chaos of, of sin, basically. We have all kinds of natural disasters and things like that. And there's a sense of uh, God bringing back order and flourishing to the universe by punishing the wicked. And the other day, that's will be fulfilled fully when Christ comes back for the second coming. And then that's kind of where we get that peace uh, from that. So you have basically four components. You have God's Trinitarian love. You have the love that God has for the victim. You have the love that he, that he gives to his people and the, and the love that he shows in terms of the universe is in terms of its flourishing. And those motivates kind of God's justice, which in turn shows love to us. Yeah, I don't, I feel like something different about all of that is going to speak differently to people. But to me, what really hit differently this time was about the Trinity. Like that made sense was Mm -hmm. that injustice with the existence, like the coexistence of love, like if the spirit or the son is blasphemed, like the father needs to take action. And then- Mm -hmm like the whole sacrifice that Jesus made for us, like that is an act of love. And so that's the ultimate act of love. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that balances right. out the judgment. And so would you, if you can like kind of expand on the Trinity a little bit, because this is a very, I feel like for people that didn't grow up in the church is one of, or even people that grew up in the church too, one of the most difficult subjects to wrap yeah. our minds around. Yeah, it definitely is. I think, um, so at the, you know, at the outset, we believe that God is uh, one being three persons. And the idea is that, you know, God is the, you know, Father, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But they're not all three gods. They're all one God. And the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. And the Spirit is not the Father. They're all individual three persons. Yet they're all brought together as one triune God, one true God. So we don't want to think of, you know, God as three gods. We don't want to think of God as three forms. Or having parts, or just being one entity. There's other types of analogies that people bring up that are heretical, but um, that's basically um, how we, we could uh, put it. And then there's analogies that we can put. I know there's a guy named Henry Morris who put came up with the analogy of uh, the analogy of times. That's past, present, and future. And you take away any of those, you don't you don't have the universe, and you don't have time itself. You need all three aspects to have time, including. Um, the universe and space, et cetera, which presupposes time. So that's the basic rundown of how we should uh, think of the Trinity. Yeah, I feel like I've always heard some of the, and I don't think we have time to go over all of the the heretical um, analogies that have been used for the Trinity that I especially heard growing up. But the time, like the aspect of time, I think that was one of the most clear examples that I've heard. So that was super yeah. helpful. Um, do you have anything else that you want to add? Uh, no, not to that. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. Okay, guys. So that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder, you can find all these episodes and podcast episodes on createworshipinspire.com. And you can even find the link to our Patreon page and our merch store. Please be sure to comment down below with any suggestions that you have for future episodes. And please be sure to like this video, share with a friend, and subscribe if you haven't already. And please be sure to follow Create Worship Inspire on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and you can join our Discord server. See you next time.